I'm Dan Edmonds and this is a Chevrolet Colorado ZR2. But this isn't just any ZR2, it's a ZR2 Bison. And that means it has an AEV option package, that stands for American Expedition Vehicles, that consists of these wheels, these extra wide fender flares on top of the ZR2's already wide bodywork, front and rear bumpers that provide extra clearance and protection, additional skid plates underneath, embroidered headrest, and special AEV rubber floor mats. But the thing that really makes a ZR2 interesting to me, whether it's a Bison or not, is the suspension behind these wheels. A ZR2 package lifts this vehicle two inches and gives it three and a half inches of extra track width. It's got some really unique shock absorbers and front and rear diff locks. That's where the interesting stuff is for me. So I'm gonna pull off these AEV wheels and have a look at what's going on under there. But before I do that, remember to like, subscribe, share with your friends, all the things. See what I mean? Now that's what I'm talking about. The ZR2 suspension is pretty special. I mean, it would have to be, right? Because the track width is about three and a half inches wider than a regular Colorado. And the only way you're gonna get that is with unique upper and lower control arms. But that's not all that's going on here. Obviously the spring is unique and the shocks. We can't forget the Multimatic DSSB shock absorbers. Okay, now I've turned the wheel and you can see everything a little bit better. Here's that unique lower control arm I mentioned. Uh, obviously, here's an aluminum steering knuckle and the stabilizer bar loops up and around and connects to the lower arm down here with this drop link. The underside of the ZR2's lower control arm is pretty interesting. Yes, it's made of cast iron, but they've put a lot of voids into it to uh, save some weight and still leave these ribs where all the strength really needs to be. And of course, we've got the stabilizer bar attachment here and then two bolts that hold the dog bone of the coil over shock to the lower control arm. And this is a little different from what we normally see. The rear leg of the lower control arm is where the bump stop registers. And you can see the witness mark left behind from yesterday's drive in the dirt. Looking at the lower control arm from this angle, we can see that it's got an eccentric here. There's another one at the uh, rear leg that you use to adjust camber and caster. It's a little tricky to get both of those because uh, you have to manipulate two eccentrics at once, but alignment techs are used to doing that. And then, of course, we can also see the motion ratio, the relative efficiency of the connection of the coilover, which is here which looks to be about 75 to 80 percent of the way out from the inner pivot and the stabilizer bar with it, which attaches here which is about 80 to 85 percent of the way out from the inner pivot so those are the efficiencies of those two components. You'll notice there's a little bit of an incline to the pivot axis of the upper control arm and that's there to provide a little bit of anti-dive so the nose doesn't sink down too quickly when you get on the brakes. Like most other off-road trucks, the ZR2 has coil-over dampers with remote reservoirs, but these are completely different. Everybody else has deflective disc valving that's mounted on either side of the piston that moves up and down when the suspension moves in this primary chamber, but the DSSV system by Multimatic doesn't work that way. Yes, there's a piston in here, but it's basically pushing oil into this second chamber, which has two spool valves, one for rebound and one for compression. Now, it's really hard for me to describe a spool valve unless I have one on the bench. I'll try to do that at some future point if I can get a take apart from Multimatic. I'm working on that. But suffice it to say for now that the main valving that does most of the work is in this second chamber. That leaves this third chamber for 
the dividing piston and the nitrogen chamber, the remote reservoir that we're used to seeing, but not uh, two chambers out. Usually it's the only chamber we see. One of the things that the ZR2 lacks is a push button system to disconnect the front stabilizer bar. I've read on, read on forums where people have removed this bolt and just left it off permanently, and that's a terrible idea because you need the stabilizer bar day in, day out to give the truck stability. If it's, if it's disconnected, then oversteer is a real potential problem, especially if you take a corner too hot or in some kind of emergency lane change or evasive maneuver. You don't want to disconnect this. That's why the Jeep and the new Bronco and the KDSS system on the 4Runner have ways to ensure that the stabilizer bar is reconnected when you're driving at highway speeds. The ZR2's front brakes are pretty straightforward. There's a ventilated rotor and a two-piston sliding caliper. Here are the two pistons here, and these are the pins on which the caliper slides. If you're wanting to change the pads, it's really easy. You just remove this bottom slider pin, pivot the whole business up, and you can get the pads in and out really easily. Well, that's about it for the front. I'm going to put the wheel and tire back on and move to the rear. Well, here we are at the back, and we've got a leaf spring, no surprise there, and another Multimatic DSSV shock absorber staring us right in the face. But, you know, that spare tire is kind of in the way. I know it's going to be when I try to see things from behind, so I'm going to get it out of there. With the spare tire out of the way, there's a whole lot more to see, and it's easier to see as well. So let's get started. Well, the ZR2's rear leaf spring pack is unique. After all, the truck has undergone a two inch lift. You can see that about one of it is the spacer right here that's underneath the leaf spring pack, but the rest is in the shape of the pack itself. This has three main leafs and one helper or overload spring. The overload spring is in contact even now, so it's going to be a fairly gentle transition from the primary spring rate to the load carrying spring rate, and I believe that's reflected in the payload of the ZR2, which is slightly lower than uh, some of the other Colorado models, but that's usually what you see in an off-road version that's trying to prioritize suspension travel and articulation. The rear bump stop sits atop the leaf pack as they usually do and this is the point on the frame where it makes contact. Up front we saw how the ZR2 gains its extra track width through the use of longer upper and lower control arms. Here it's just a longer axle tube in this area. Here at the back we can see that the Multimatic damper assembly is inverted, and by that I mean the eye and the shaft and this guard are attached to the axle, whereas the body of the shock and the valve assembly is attached to the frame side, and so this is the best position for unsprung mass, and also it protects all of this by keeping it up high and out of the way. Here's something I don't like about the ZR2, and it's not just the ZR2, it's really based on the Colorado because the ZR2 is really just a version of the Colorado. And what am I talking about? I'm talking about the mounting of the shock absorber inboard of the spring. It makes this vulnerable when you're on rocky trails. In fact, this is lower than the center of the diff. This diff, by the way, is protected by an extra skid plate that's part of the bison package. So that's nice. But still, this shock and the one on the other side are actually as low or a little bit lower than this. So when you're picking your way through a rocky trail, you've got to imagine three things that you're trying to avoid. In a Toyota where the shock is mounted outboard of the spring, it's way up in here. And that pretty much means you just have to worry about the tire and the diff because the shock's going to be so close to the tire that it'll be protected by it. The ZR2's rear brakes 
are comprised of a ventilated rotor and a single piston sliding caliper. But there's also a drum brake inside here for parking. It's time to see how much these Goodyear Wrangler Duratrek and AEV wheels weigh. This is the same tire you'd get on a regular ZR2, but a different wheel. 265, 65, 17, 31 inch tire. And together they weigh 68 pounds. I know it looks like this is the wrap up, but I'm not done yet. I'm gonna put the tire on, but then I'm gonna drive it into my backyard and put the ZR2 on my flex index ramp to see how well it articulates. Well, the wheels are back on, obviously, and I've driven the truck up against my ramp. And as you can see, there is a lot of clearance up here, you know, more than a foot. And, you know, that wasn't a given, actually. Well, it was with the ZR2, but if I was to bring a regular Colorado, even a Z71 here, uh, I wouldn't be able to drive up the ramp because a regular Colorado isn't lifted like this one and it has a much more conventional front bumper with a really stiff air dam bolted to the bottom of that and it's that air dam which makes contact with the cheese grater that is my ramp. So for a regular Colorado to go up this ramp I have to first remove that air dam but obviously a ZR2 and the Bison has much more clearance up front because of its unique front end and then of course it's lifted some two inches so this is going to be a cakewalk. The only question is how far up will it go and how much will that suspension we just looked at flex on my ramp. Did you see that? The traction control was actually helping out. I didn't have any buttons pressed. It was just low range, no diffs locked at all. And yet when this rear tire started to get light, it still moved forward, the truck I mean. It didn't just spin in place. So I think I might be right where I need to be, uh, even though this tire was right on the edge of coming off the ground. But there's only one way to check. Yeah, I can bounce the truck off the ground without very much effort at all. There's almost no weight on the tire. So this is where I need to be in order to make my measurement because this indicates that we've reached the point of maximum articulation. Well, there's a lot of clearance here even though the suspension is loaded on the ramp. There's at least a foot. Now, the approach angle, well, right here, the approach angle at this point isn't what you see in the spec sheet because they usually measure it at the worst case place in the center. So in front of the tire, because of the way the ZR2 and the Bison have this corner raised up, there's even more clearance than there is uh, when you look at the spec sheet. It's now time to make the measurement. I'm lining this edge up with the center of the wheel and it won't look exactly centered to you, but it does from my angle. And it looks like that's the spot. So I'll put a little tape there and get out the tape measure after that. Looks like 22 inches even. So our measurement was 22 inches of lift, but we need to know how far it drove up the ramp, which doesn't have a sharp enough nose to make a direct measurement. So instead, we divide 22 by the sine of 20 degrees, which is the angle of the ramp, and that comes out to 64.3 inches. 
But that's not enough. We need to know how that compares to the wheelbase of the vehicle. And the ZR2's wheelbase is 128.5. So if we take 64.3 and divide it by 128.5, then I multiply by 1,000 to get rid of decimal places, we'll get a flex index score. And that is 501. It's 500.5, but I round up. 501. That is pretty stout. Wow, can you believe it? The ZR2 Bison suspension looks great, and this ramp test just proved that it flexes a lot too. 501 points from a factory off-road package. I can't remember another compact that's done that well. So, if you like what you saw, remember to like, subscribe, share with your friends. And until next time, this is Dan Edmonds saying thanks for watching.